So what we've done here is talk about variational formulations. And classically, variational formulations refer to constructing a functional or a variational principle And so what I mean by that, if we go back, you know, here at the very beginning we had a functional, uh, and then here we constructed a variational principle. Okay. So that's what I mean by a functional or a variational principle. So classically, variational formulations refer to constructing a functional or a variational principle that is equivalent to the governing equation. Right. But the modern use, when you hear it, variational principle typically talked about now, The modern use of this, of the phrase, refers to a formulation where the governing equations are translated into an equivalent weighted integral statement. So what's a weighted integral statement? So if you, if you remember from the PowerPoint lecture that I went through the other day, I talked about that in, in finite elements what we do is we take a displacement field U and we approximate it with U of H, which is the summation of some discrete nodes plus some interpolating functions between those nodes plus the summation of some coefficients and interpolating functions that aren't necessarily related to the nodes. So the values uj are the discrete values of u at the nodes, okay? But in our discussion today, we haven't discretized anything yet. We have no finite elements. We have no nodes. All right? So, you know, so we have no nodes. So what we're going to seek today is a solution of the form
where this extra term, sole purpose, is to satisfy. the BCs, the boundary conditions. So let's consider the following. And so, without knowing why, or without saying why, let's choose this. Let's choose phi1 equal to x squared minus 2x, phi2 equal to x cubed minus 3x, phi3 equal to 1. And to simplify this equation, we'll let L equal 1, UO equal 1, QO equal 0, A of X equal to X, C of X equal to 1, and F of X equal to 0. So basically, we wrote a very generic differential equation, and then I'm just plugging in some values for these to simplify it. So with that, we have d dx x du dx plus u equals 0. Or that implies, just applying the chain rule here, minus dx dx du dx plus du squared dx squared x plus u equals 0. Of course, this is just 1. With u equal to 1 and x, partial u, partial x equal to 0. Evaluate x equal to l. OK. So now let's plug in our approximate solution. So we said that u is approximately equal to u at h c1 times phi1 x squared minus 2x plus c2 phi2 x cubed minus 3x plus 1. And I guess to be consistent with what I wrote before, this phi 3 should be phi 0. It's this term that's there to satisfy the boundary condition. This should be phi, phi 0. So that's our solution. Let's compute these derivatives real quick. C1, 2x minus 2 plus 
c2 3x squared minus 3 c1 So plugging all that back into the differential equation, we have c1, 2x minus 2, c2, 3x squared minus 3, 2x, c1, minus 6, 2. All of that is equal to zero. So that's just plugging our approximate solution back into the differential equation. Okay? So in order for this to be zero, the coefficients of all the powers of x have to be equal to zero, right? So if we look at those, and coefficients of x3 So all of those have to be equal to zero. Well, is there any combination of C1 and C2 that will guarantee that all those are equal to zero? No. And why would we expect there to be? We just guessed, right? Remember I said when I picked those fees, I said, let's just, without knowing why, let's just choose these values and plug them in and see what happens. <laughs> so that doesn't work. <clears throat> so let's go back to the original equation. And let's multiply both sides of the equation by something arbitrary. So now we want this statement to be true in the integral sense, meaning not true point-wise at every point, like the differential equation is, but rather true over the entire body. So the statement to be true over the entire body. So then, so we're going to multiply by something arbitrary and then we're going to integrate over the body. In this case, the body's one dimensional and it goes from zero to L, or zero to one, right? So when we do that, we multiply, we integrate over the body. And this is called a weighted integral or weighted residual statement. So you think of this like a weight, and this is a residual. So this is the weighted integral statement. And so now, if we choose a couple of linear 
independent functions for del u will have exactly the same number of equations as unknowns. So let's write out what R is. So we're, here we're using the same fees as before, the ones we just chose arbitrarily. And let's choose del u1 to be equal to 1 and del u2 to be equal to x. And so then we have from 0 to 1, 1 times r dx, that equals to 1 plus 2c1 plus 3C2 plus 1 half 6C1 minus 3C2 1 third And if we solve these two equations, what we'll get is that C1 equals to 2, 2, 2 over 23. And C2 is equal to minus 100 over 23. All right. So, I didn't actually practice this. I'm going to see if I can, on the fly, show you what the approximation looks like with respect to the real solution in Mathematica. So, depending on the choice of those del ui's, we arrive at the different weighted residual methods. So if we choose del ui, so if we, if we choose del ui to be equal to phi i, then we have a Glurk, what's, what's called a Glurkin method. If we choose it to be something different, say something different. Then we typically call this petroff glurkit method. If you choose it to be this, we get a least squares method. And 
And if you choose it to be this, you get a collocation method. That's where this guy is the Dirac delta function. So that is, it's equal to zero when x is not equal to xi, and it's equal to one when x is equal to xi. So of all these four methods, only the least squared method results in a symmetric matrix for coefficient matrix. So in the last example, I didn't write it out, but if we would have wrote out, evaluated all those terms, then we'd have had so it's obviously not symmetric. And that's because we were using basically what amounts to a petroff galerkin scheme. And the reason we like symmetric coefficient matrices is for numerical solution, right, uh, and implementing on a computer. Symmetric matrices are easier to solve, and they're also easier to store memory-wise, because you only have to have to store half the matrix, right, which probably on most of the problem, certainly on the problems we're going to solve in this class, probably on most of the problems you'll encounter, it won't matter. Right, uh, as far as storage, we have big computers now that can store a lot of things. But I mean, you know, it may be if you go on and uh, you know maybe in your PhD research or certainly when you get out in industry and try to solve like reservoir scale problems, that you know you're going to be have big big, mat you know coefficient matrices, and it, and it could really matter whether it's symmetric or not. <coughs> 